something stinks. Well, it's not me. It's me. G'day there, my name's Chris. And I'm Nathan. And this is Cinema Biosis, the show where we take a look at a film and its strange and oftentimes baffling connections to other media. And today, we're taking a look at the swords and sorcery, well, I don't want to say epic. <laughs> no. Let's just say we're looking at Cole the Conqueror, starring Kevin Sorbo and directed by John Nicolella, who was best known for directing the classics. Hold on, give me a second, I'll just check. We are screwed. Hey, no, hey, I don't want to hear that defeatist attitude. I want to hear you upbeat. We are screwed. There you go. So I suggested this movie because apparently I'm an idiot, but you were very keen to do it when I first spoke about it because you were a little confused, weren't you, Nathan? I was like, yeah, that movie's awesome. The glaive in the lava, the cyclops. And then you had to remind me that was a uh, crawl, not coal. Yeah, I, I was like, mate, that's not coal, that's crawl. <laughs> I was so disappointed. I'm like, what the hell's coal? I had to look it up. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Wait a minute. This isn't my world. Look, the only real reason I suggested this film is because I saw it as a kid and remembered a really cool set piece from the film involving a temple with lots of booby traps and a huge beast that had to be slayed by Cull, which, by the way, doesn't appear in this film whatsoever. Yeah, I don't know what the hell you watched, but that's definitely not this movie. Look, I'm thinking now maybe it was an episode of Hercules, The Legendary Jones. <laughs> and and I, I, I guess we should get that out of the way. A lot of people are going to associate this movie with Hercules, which also stars Kevin Sorbo. And it's kind of the only thing I know him from, really. And it's the reason I watched this film on cable when I was a kid. I think Hercules works better because you get Kevin Sorbo in smaller allotments. Like, he's not holding up a whole film. Oh, I would say attempting to hold up a film, if we're being honest. The wind is up. Unfurl the sails. Well, in true bad film fashion, this starts with a text crawl with someone talking over the top of it. Hey, that's not just someone talking. That's our hero, Cole. But he's just given us kind of a list of names and places, and just general world building guff. Yeah, there's that guy, Shigaro Wrath and Sigaro Duru. And you're like, who? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. It's just like a list of meaningless names and places. It doesn't mean anything to you or me or the audience. But at least we were introduced to Cull, our hero, pretty early on, alongside another important element of the film, awfully cheesy metal music. Look, I'm a fan of metal music, but this just didn't work for me. Like, when I think of fantasy, I think of big bombastic strings, kind of like an orchestral score. Uh, I think it's a sign of the times, because when did this movie come out? Uh, 1997. Yeah, that's about right. Yeah, I mean, which is the same year as Man O' War's anthology album, which, you know, is suitable, because sometimes I felt like I was watching a Man O' War film clip when I was watching Cull. Oh! But yeah, after our exposition dump at the beginning of the film, we get a fight scene, but it honestly feels like it should be near the climax or something. Like, we have no idea what's going on or who's who in the scheme of things. Yeah, it's like, who am I going for? <laughs> it's like, oh, I, I notice Hercules, so it has to be him. Oh, who needs good characterization or setup? Kevin Sorbo's name's on the box. Guess he's the good guy. <laughs> what did you call me? So, after the fight that opens the movie, Cole just kind of wanders into the plot when he accidentally becomes king. And how does that happen, Nathan? This sounds like there's going to be a complex answer here, but there isn't. Doesn't he just, like, kill the king in a fight and then gets made king? Yeah, the king has gone mad and murderous, and Cole is kind of just there, I guess, so he 
stops him and becomes king. He really doesn't have much motivation or anything to do it. He wasn't like, I'm going to rule this land and free my people. No, because that would be interesting and give him some actual personal stakes to the plot. Instead, the king just spitefully gives Cole the crown so as to prevent his heirs from being king. And I guess after that, he's just King Cole. So, you know, even though that sounds suspiciously like a very different film to me. Yeah, that's the main thrust of our plot for a little while. The heirs to the throne team up and they try to overthrow Cull via some failed assassination attempts. And then it brings in the biggest subplot or main plot of the demon queen? Yeah, the sorceress. So there's a character played by Tia Carrera and I don't know how I'm going to say this with a straight face, but she's playing Akivasha, the sorceress queen <laughs> of the ancient Archeron Empire, which the god Valka destroyed the ages before Volusia was built on its remains. <laughs> Look, this is based on a book, a pretty influential book as well, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But regardless, this just sounds like the most cliche fantasy guff. It's the kind of thing I used to come up with for tabletop games. Yeah, it just sounds like a D and D. Like I roll for initiative. I cast a spell. Where's the Mountain Dew? In the fridge. Duh. I want to cast a spell. Can I have a Mountain Dew? Yes, you can have a Mountain Dew. Just go get it. I want to cast magic missile. So this sorceress has a few different powers, like she has pyromancy, or at least the kind that conjures bad late 90s CG flames. Sacred flame, protect us from the cold! And transformation? Yeah, true, because she actually transforms at the end of the movie. I mean, spoilers there, but we're not really ruining some big special effects surprise there. But she's got some more powers as well. You know when a car goes off a cliff in a bad action movie and it just kind of explodes? Well, I guess she can do that to people as well for some reason. Yeah, and you're like, oh, okay. So why don't she just do that to Cole? No, she's going to marry him so she can rule the land? Yeah, and then lock him in a dungeon. It's like, why lock him up? You know he's going to escape. Like, if you can blow people up, just blow up Cole. He's right there. Wait, aren't you even going to watch them? They could get away. No, no, no. I'm going to leave them alone and not actually witness them dying. I'm just going to assume it all went to plan. What? Oh, but when he eventually does escape, that makes me so mad because the necromancer who raised the sorceress from the dead has this pig man slave thing. And the only piece of characterization we ever get for Cole is that he protects slaves. Yet he starts beating this pig man up. Actually, doesn't he kill him? Yeah, Cole kills him to open the door. <laughs> Yeah, Cole has to search out a MacGuffin called the Breath of Volker, which he finds with the help of a concubine slash fortune teller of the former king and her brother, who is a pacifist, apparently. Yeah, I won't raise a sword against a man. I'll save on fire. <laughs> but I won't raise a sword against him. Yeah, it's like, oh, he's got no problem near burning someone, but stabbing. No, 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 no. That's true violence. Whoa! Check it out! Mad Dog's on fire! Stop, drop, and roll, man! Ha ha ha! That's for Clyde's, baby. A little fire can't hurt you. The Breath of Volker is literally a spell that takes over the body of the concubine fortune teller, and it's the only way they can stop the sorceress from reaching her ultimate form, which is what? Oh, big ugly demon thing, like, <laughs> surrounded by fire. You see it for like, what, half a minute? Listen, I know you hate the way the sorceress was taken out in this movie, Nathan. Why don't you tell us how that was done? Although you might have to go back a little bit towards the beginning of the movie because there's a scene with Cull and the concubine slash fortune teller that sets it up a little. Cull's like having a bath and she's doing tarot reading cards and she's like, The fate of your kingdom will be found within a kiss. So he grabs her and kisses her because he thinks, you know, she's cracking onto him and she looks at him odd. And then I'm like, oh, okay, that was weird. But it does have a payoff, because later on, he has to kiss her to get the breath of Valka in him. And then what does he do? And then later on, he grabs the demon and kisses it, and she dies. <laughs> and you're like, what? <laughs> yeah. It's such an unnecessary plot complication in a movie full of unnecessary plot complications. Seems like a... A high school play someone wrote because they wanted to kiss someone. I know you're talking about Kevin Sorbo kissing the actress who plays the concubine here, but I love to imagine he asked for it to be inserted just so he could kiss the puppet of the transformed sorceress. <laughs> <laughs> Good looking puppet. <laughs>
Look, shout out to Tia Carrera for giving the greatest interpretation of Rita Repulsa to never feature in a Power Rangers movie. Lo, send my swift destruction across the sea. She, she's actually putting in the effort. Kevin Sorbo is just so flat. Yeah, he really isn't great in this. I could look past a pretty wooden performance if he had the presence to pull off the film, but he really doesn't. Like, he started his career as a male model, and he feels like a male model here, not a barbarian. If Conan is a barbarian, then Sorbo would be his bookish, nerdy brother. Conan, the librarian. I'm sorry. These books are a little overdue. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's the thing is you got Arnie does Conan the Barbarian and you're like, yeah, that looks like a guy who could just take out anyone. Yeah, totally. Like he has that physical presence. And I mean, Arnie's not a great actor, especially in the first Conan film, but he just sells it so well through his physicality and his charisma, unlike Sorbo in Cole. There's a lot of uh, differences as well, and one is probably in terms of body size. Arnold was a lot bigger than I was. And it's actually pretty apt we bring up Arnie and Conan the Barbarian, because those films are tied directly to the production of Cole because the original title for this movie was actually Conan the Conqueror, and it was to be the third Conan film, which actually makes sense because the end of the first Conan foreshadows the idea of King Conan. Oh, and it continues on. So he's a king, the heirs want to take him out. There's this other element in the background of a, a rising, you know, demon queen, whatever. Yeah, that would have been awesome. <laughs> hey, hey, are you implying what we got in Cole wasn't awesome? Oh boy, you should have seen your face. <laughs> you should see yours. So the plot for this movie is loosely based on the Conan book The Hour of the Dragon by Robert E. Howard, and there was full intention to get Arnie on board to reprise his role, but when the Austrian Oak himself turned down the film, there was a scramble to recast. To do this kind of movie after Conan, 16 years after Conan, I think you have to... Without the right guy in the lead, I would not have wanted to make this movie. And it took us almost three years to find Kevin. But according to a few sources I found online, the producers didn't want to try and recast Conan. And Kevin Sorbo allegedly didn't want to play the character either. He didn't want to be Conan. No, he supposedly didn't want to play such a well-worn character. So Conan was changed to Cull, another Robert E. Howard creation. Yeah, okay. But even if this was originally supposed to be a Conan film, it's pretty toothless compared to the original. When they're fighting in the um, ice caves and that, and he fights like 30 people running towards him, he's taking all these people out. I'm like, there's not a drop of blood in this film. The only blood you see is when he pours it out of that thousand year old vial on the dagger. Yeah it's so tame compared to Conan the Barbarian, which was not afraid to show us kind of blood and guts on screen. And it just makes the action really feel like it means something. You know why, Nathan? If it bleeds, we can kill it. But according to the film's screenwriter, Charles Edward Pogue, the original intention was to create a brawny, violent, and very much more adult film in the vein of the original Conan. But allegedly, Sorbo refused to sign on unless it was all toned down. So that, in tandem with a director who normally works in TV, means everything feels really lightweight and cold when it comes to action and violence. Honestly, it just feels like an extended Hercules episode. I would say Hercules is often more entertaining, because at least it's not trying to be a serious film but failing. It and its spin-off Xena Warrior Princess are cheesy, yes, but they know exactly what they're doing. Of you to drop in. <laughs> so, Nathan, would you recommend this movie? <laughs> okay, Cole the Conqueror. If you like the Hercules series, like you love the Hercules TV series, you'll like this movie. I personally didn't enjoy it. I want to enjoy it. It's got all the stuff to make it a, like one of those, you know, a good bad movie. But it's just, it's so middle of the road, it comes out boring. I can't recommend it. Would you recommend it? <laughs> Look, it's watchable. I don't think it's a slog like some of the other films we've watched, but it just can't decide on what it wants to be. It's never good enough to compete with something like Conan the Barbarian, and it's never campy enough to be as fun as Hercules. But like you said, if you like that series, it's probably worth a watch just because you get to see Sorbo on screen some more. But if you're after anything more, you're likely to be disappointed.